If there's one economic equation that almost everyone can agree on, it's that time is money. That's why it's standard practice for corporations to closely monitor how their workers use their time, either through time cards, GPS trackers, or for those managing remote workers, employee monitoring tools. But what if the bosses could manipulate time itself? What if they could take time and stretch it out and compress it however they wanted? Thanks to a very counterintuitive property of the universe that Albert Einstein discovered more than a hundred years ago, it's actually possible to do that. The trick is to go really, really fast, relatively speaking. So chances are you already have a good understanding of at least one kind of relativity. If you're moving at a steady speed, for instance an ocean liner on smooth water with no land in sight, it's as though you're not moving at all. The ship and everyone on it are in what physicists call an inertial frame of reference. Let's say I'm on this ocean liner sailing 30 miles an hour toward person A, and let's say I toss them a tennis ball at 30 miles an hour. In my inertial frame, the ball is moving away from me at 30 miles an hour. But from person A's inertial frame, the ball is moving towards them at 60 miles an hour. The idea of inertial frames and how they move relative to each other is the kind of ordinary relativity we experience every day. It's sometimes called the Galilean relativity because Galileo was the first to spell the concept out. He did it in this 1632 book, Dialogue Concerning the Two Chief World Systems. The book itself was declared heresy a year later and Galileo spent the last nine years of his life under house arrest. But the ideas in it stuck, and Galilean relativity remained an unchallenged maxim of physics for the next two and a half centuries or so. In 1865, the Scottish mathematician James Clerk Maxwell demonstrated that electrical and magnetic fields propagated through space at the speed of light. But his equations describing the motions of electromagnetic waves stood at odds with how physicists of the time believed everything else moved. One big problem was spotted by the American physicists Albert Michelson and Edward Morley. They had been conducting a series of experiments to detect the luminiferous ether, a medium they believed enabled light waves to propagate through a vacuum. Those experiments failed because there's no such thing as a luminiferous ether. But their measurements of the velocity of light relative to the velocity of the Earth suggested something really mind-bending. When it came to light, the familiar rules didn't apply. Michelson and Morley found that no matter what direction the Earth was moving, forward, backward, sideways, relative to a light source, the light always clocked in at the same speed. It sounds so weird, but this has been confirmed over and over again since then. The speed of light in a vacuum, represented as C, is the same for all observers, exactly 299,792,458 meters per second, no matter what. The speed of light doesn't change depending on how fast you're moving relative to it. If you're standing still, this is the speed of light. If you're flying in a spaceship alongside a beam of light and you're traveling at 99% the speed of light, this is the speed of light. Unlike the speeds of our tennis ball, the speed of light is the same no matter how you move relative to it. The speed of light is the same regardless of the observer. And as Albert Einstein discovered in 1905, this invariance has implications that can turn our very ideas of time and space inside out. His explanation is called the special theory of relativity. And if that makes no sense to you, that's normal. The human brain is just not set up to visualize this. Our eyes and brain weren't even built to process or even see objects moving that fast. In an experiment, Air Force pilots were able to recognize an image of a plane flashed on a screen for as little as 1 220th of a second. An object would have to be traveling faster than the speed of light for it to become invisible to the human eye, but the faster an object moves, the less likely the combination of our brain and eyes will be fast enough to track its movement. Studies have shown that when we're tracking a moving object, the human brain doesn't even necessarily track the object's motion as much as it works to predict where the object will likely end up. Wait, Dr. Shannon, 
Can you help us wrap our brains around special relativity? Sure. Let's go back to tennis balls on ships for a moment. This time, let's say I'm sailing left to right relative to person A, moving at four meters per second. And let's say I toss this ball upward, so it travels at three meters per second. We're not gonna worry about things like air resistance or gravity. Let's only focus on the fact that I'm in an inertial frame, and I observe a ball moving vertically at three meters per second. But that's not what person A would observe. From person A's perspective, they're moving at four meters per second, which means they see the ball moving diagonally. This diagonal line is longer. That means person A observed the ball moving a greater distance than I did in the same time period. In other words, it was moving faster for person A than it was for me. But how much faster? Since we're thinking in triangles, we can actually figure this out using the Pythagorean theorem. Besides tormenting math students, the Pythagorean theorem also says that in a right triangle, the length of the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the square of its legs. You know, x squared equals y squared plus z squared. So, from person A's perspective, the ball traveled at a speed of 3 squared is 9 and 4 squared is 16, and add those together and take the square root, person A observed it moving at 5 meters per second, while I observed the ball traveling at 3 meters per second. Same ball, different distances, different speeds. But now let's suppose that instead of throwing a ball upward, I'm shooting a laser upward. And let's suppose I'm still traveling sideways relative to person A. And maybe I'm on a spaceship this time. In my inertial frame, a photon emitted by this laser pointer travels in a straight, vertical line at the speed of light. We'll say D for distance, C for the speed of light, and T for the time elapsed. And from person A's perspective, the light moves diagonally, like the tennis ball did. And just like with the ball, I observed the light traveling a longer distance compared to what person A sees. But there's a big difference. Unlike the tennis ball, the light does not appear to move any faster from my perspective. When I observe the laser's speed, I get the same measurements as person A. Remember, the speed of light, C, does not change. So if one distance is greater than the other, and the speed of light refuses to change, then something else has to give. And there's only one variable left time. People in different inertial frames can observe the same event and disagree about how long it took. In our example, to compensate for the fixed speed of light, my measurement of time aboard person A's ship has to slow down. It sounds bizarre, but that's what the math says. This phenomenon is called time dilation, and it's one of the most famous implications of Einstein's special theory of relativity. Time dilation affects all moving objects, but in our everyday lives, the effects are usually so tiny they can't be measured. Unless you're an astronomer or astrophysicist, or you work with GPS satellites, which have to take relativity into account when managing their internal clocks, you probably never notice it. But how fast do you need to be going to noticeably warp time? You can actually work that out using the Pythagorean theorem too. Lucky for us, Albert Einstein derived the equation back in 1905, so we don't have to. Today, it's known as the time dilation equation. If we give it a velocity and the time interval measured by an observer moving at that velocity, it will tell us how much time is measured by an observer at rest. So for instance, the fastest spacecraft built so far is NASA's Parker Solar Probe. It broke its own speed record last November when it orbited the sun at a top speed of 364,621 miles per hour. So assuming all else is equal, if you were on a spacecraft traveling as fast as the Parker Solar Probe's top speed relative to Earth and you experienced the passage of one year, those back on Earth would experience, and we need to be precise with this, one year plus 4.6646 seconds, you'd be about five seconds younger. Now you see why we don't experience time dilation in our everyday lives. It's only noticeable when you're traveling at a speed comparable to the speed of light. We don't yet have spacecraft that can do that, but it's not inconceivable. In 2016, Mark Zuckerberg and Stephen Hawking founded a project with the Russian billionaire Yuri Milner to send a fleet of space probes to Alpha Centauri. 
The project, called Breakthrough Starshot, would use tiny space chips, no bigger than a smartphone attached to large light sails. Lasers fired from the Earth at the sails would propel the probes to about 20% of the speed of light, allowing them to make the journey in about 20 years from Earth's perspective. This technology has not yet been proven to work, but if it did, the time dilation effects would be just about big enough to notice. From the perspective of the probes, a journey of 20 years would take just... 19.6 years. Traveling at 20% the speed of light saves you about one week every year. At faster speeds, the difference becomes more noticeable. A spacecraft traveling away from us at 90% the speed of light would experience only one year for every 2.3 years that we experience. At 99% the speed of light, it's one year for every seven years. And at 99.9% .9 the speed of light, it becomes one year for every 22 years. And as you get even closer to the speed of light, the difference grows dramatically. If you could somehow accelerate to the speed of light, which you can't, you would have to divide by zero. Essentially, all time outside your frame of reference would stop, and all distances would contract by zero. But physics says that doing so is impossible. As you approach the speed of light, your mass also increases. So as your velocity goes up, so does your relativistic mass compared to your rest mass. As your mass increases, it takes more energy to accelerate. Eventually, you'll reach a point where there isn't enough energy available in the universe to accelerate you any faster. Now, there are a couple big things we should mention. The first is that gravity also has a huge effect on time dilation. That's part of Einstein's general theory of relativity, which Einstein formulated 10 years later in 1916, and which we've been completely ignoring, except to point out that time proceeds more slowly the closer one is to a large mass like the Earth. So that cancels out some of the special relativistic time dilation effects that you can get when traveling through space at a high speeds. The second is something called the Twins Paradox. At some point in watching this, you might have asked yourself, doesn't time dilation cut both ways? Suppose you have an identical twin who is an astronaut. Your twin flies away in a spaceship at 99% the speed of light and then comes back to Earth. Traveling close to the speed of light causes time to slow down, so you might assume that, upon returning, your twin is now younger than you. But remember that all motion is relative. Your twin could be equally justified in saying that, from their standpoint, the Earth moved away at 99% the speed of light and came back to them. Therefore, you are the one who is younger. Both of you can't be right. Physicists have several different ways of resolving it, but essentially it comes down to the fact that, at some point, your twin astronaut has to turn around to come back to Earth. Changing direction means that the astronaut is no longer in one inertial frame. So this equation for solving time dilation doesn't work for that astronaut. The solution can be calculated a few different ways, but the math always shows that the traveling twin will be younger than the Earth-bound one. It's easy to imagine how, at these speeds, the rich and powerful could manipulate time for their own gain. For instance, imagine working on a spacecraft traveling at 90% the speed of light relative to the Earth. For every month that passes on your spaceship, more than seven months pass on Earth. If history has taught us anything, it's that your wages will be calculated according to spaceship time, and that the interest on your debts will accrue according to Earth time. Meanwhile, wealthy people could effectively use time dilation to fast forward through history while their investments grow. An investor could leave Earth for 22 years and return having only aged one year. Maybe our society's class differences could become timescale differences. Humanity could split in two. With the overwhelming majority of people seeming to have the lifespan of insects, compared to a class of seemingly immortal beings that drop out of the sky every few decades to collect their dividend checks. On the plus side, perhaps time dilation could also be used to benefit everybody. In a world where the ability to achieve relativistic speeds is widespread, it could be possible to organize society's functions along different timescales. The population could live in inertial frames moving at high speeds, while land for crops could be established at slower velocities. That way, food could be produced more quickly. The same principle could be used to make factories more efficient for hospitals to allow patients to recover more quickly, for vaccines to be developed, and for environmentally threatened areas to be restored. 
Maybe this is too far off in the future to even speculate about. Humanity is probably centuries, if not thousands of years away from developing technology that will enable a space habitat to accelerate to anywhere near the speed of light. Of course, whether you think that's a long time away or not at all depends on your perspective. It's all relative. For more videos like this, subscribe to this channel right now and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any great content. And look out for CuriosityStream on social media. Links in the description.